Security and computing. This is a subject that has been discussed a lot, especially in the recent years when, you know, more and more attacks have been happening. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at one particular aspect of computer security, and that is the whole concept of encryption. How do you hide your data in a way that can be revealed, but only by the intended recipient? And what measures can be taken to ensure that the message you get comes from the person you think it comes from and whether its contents have been compromised? All this and more in today's episode of 0612 TV. Hello and welcome to another Random Wednesday episode. Now, before we begin, I do of course want to thank all the professors who've actually, you know, helped in making me understand this better. There was a recent change in school policy that actually requires a lot of the different modules to start talking about security in tandem with whatever is part of the module, which means I have lots of professors to thank for this. So thanks go out to Dr. Liao Wee King, Dr. Lubomia Bik, and Dr. Chan Man Chun for their teaching of security related matters in their curriculum. Now, communications in general can actually be very simple. Let's say now we have A and B, two computers at two different locations, and let's say A wants to send a message to B. What we can do is we can connect them via a network, and the simplest way to represent this would be to just simply draw a line between these two points. This line, of course, representing a path of communications. Using software that is able to communicate over this network, all we have to do is just send the information. Conceptually, in terms of just having the communication, that's basically all there is. If we had no security concerns, we could stop right here. That is all we need and the communications will work perfectly. But then comes the security concerns. What if someone were to tap into the line and listen in on the communications? If I was sending some sensitive data from point A to point B, I wouldn't want this information to be tapped upon by someone else. While preventing the medium from being tapped on is one possible solution to this, we could also encode our data in a particular manner such that even if someone were to tap on this data and listen to it, they wouldn't be able to make sense out of this information. That is where the concept of encryption comes in. Simply put, in encryption, you take plain text and you perform some kind of mathematical operation to this text. When you're done with performing this encryption algorithm, what you get is what looks like a bunch of garbled, messy data. So of course, what this means now is that the person who is tapping onto this communication will be able to see the stuff you sent, but not make sense out of it. Of course, that's all well and good, but the recipient of this information must somehow extract your original message out of this garbled data. This of course refers to the act of decryption, which is of course just the inverse of encryption. Encryption produces this garbled data. Decryption takes this garbled data and turns it back into plain text. So that's all well and good. We can now prevent someone from actually tapping in and listening to the communications. So all right, we sort of have a picture in our minds about you know encryption and decryption. But let's look a little bit further into the specifics of doing this. First of all, it is important to note that encryption and decryption is just a function. Think of it as a black box that, you know, if I threw some data at it, it will do some math to this data and throw out whatever it has actually produced. A lot of the times, these encryption and decryption algorithms are public algorithms. So since the math done by the algorithm is actually known, we need some other way to actually prevent this information from being decryptable, except by the parties involved. And the way this is normally done is by introducing what is known as a key. You see, the key is simply a piece of data that is actually used inside the mathematical formula used by either your encryption or decryption algorithm. So I hope you're not too confused, and to make this a little bit better, let's consider a very simple encryption and decryption algorithm. Let's say now all the information I want to send are numbers. The way my encryption algorithm works is it simply takes all the numbers and adds a value to each of these numbers. And this is just my very simplified way of hiding the original data. So let's say everybody knows how this works. Everybody understands that, oh, this encryption method simply adds something to the existing value. The way we can actually still continue to preserve privacy 
is to actually make the value that is added unknown. In particular, we can allow this value to be changed and specified in the form of a key. What this means is my encryption method currently looks something like this. All it does is it takes in your plain text and it takes in the key. All it does is adds these two values together and returns the encrypted version of this plain text. The decryption part of the algorithm simply needs to take in the cipher text and subtract away the key. And that way, you will get the original data back. Anyone who's actually eavesdropping to this information will not know how much to actually subtract these values by. And as a result, will not actually be able to figure out what was the data that was originally sent. Hopefully, this simple example makes things clearer. The concept of an encryption algorithm, a decryption algorithm, as well as that of a key. So now let's consider some challenges of actually implementing this. Of course, first by addressing the elephant in the room, and that is how do you actually convey the key from one point to another? Obviously, in our example, point A and point B already know what the key is. However, speaking practically, this information also needs to be conveyed somehow. One proposed solution, of course, is to actually have a key distribution center, sort of just a party that we all trust. They basically store all the keys that everyone is going to use. So what this means is if A wanted to send something to B, they'll go to the key distribution center and they will say, okay, I'm A and I want to send stuff to B. Give me a key that will work for this situation. So yeah, that is one possible way to actually have this method work. However, there are still some problems that our current setup cannot actually address. And that is, for example, if A says to B, I will send you $100. Now, what happens if this particular eavesdropper in the center actually records this message? He cannot make sense of this message, but he can just play it back verbatim. At any point of time, he can sort of make A send B $100. If you are B, you had no idea whether or not this information was actually sent by A or someone else pretending to be A. At the same time, if A sends you this message, at a different point of time, he could deny that he was the one who sent it. You have no way of proving that it was definitely sent by A. That is why this particular setup isn't perfect just yet. We need to take a look at some other measures to actually make this better. Let's take a look now at a method called public key cryptography. You might have heard of this, even though it might not be easy to understand immediately, but normally when people talk about public key cryptography, you'll hear concepts such as a public key and a private key, and how each one of these are actually used in tandem to actually encrypt communications and ensure that everything works the way you would expect. Similar to the method we've seen in a previous episode, the algorithm used to actually do all the encryption and decryption is actually known. The only thing that is kept secret is the key. Do also note that in the context of public key cryptography, your algorithm for encryption and decryption are the same. You can use the same algorithm for encryption or decryption, depending on what key you put in. And what this means is your encryption key and your decryption key are related in a certain way. So now that we know this, what is public key cryptography? You see now, every single party holds on to two keys, a public key as well as a private key. As its name implies, the public key is actually known to the public, whereas the private key is something that you keep to yourself. Do also note that your public key and private key are related in such a way that information encrypted using the public key can be decrypted using the private key. The converse is true as well, information encoded using the private key can be decrypted using the public key. So let's say now A wants to send something to B. All A needs to do is to take a look at B's public key. You can then use B's public key to actually encrypt this data and send it to him. Anyone eavesdropping on this data will not be able to actually decrypt it because, well, they don't know B's private key. What this means is the concept of secrecy is there. Only B can decrypt this piece of data. Remember how when we looked at our previous method of encryption, which by the way is called symmetric key cryptography because the same key is used on both ends. When we looked at symmetric key cryptography, the issue is in actually conveying that secret key from one point to another. In this particular case, we no longer face that problem because of course, we keep the secret keys to ourselves, whereas we publish a public key that anyone can use. 
This actually streamlines the process, and for now, we can actually cut away the key distribution authority. However, the other problems that come about with symmetric key cryptography still stand. We still need to find some way to actually prove who sent a particular piece of information and to basically prevent the playback attack that we actually considered in the previous episode. Now, the way to prevent a playback attack is actually relatively simple. For example, if I were to actually include a timestamp in my entire encrypted communication, that would actually solve the problem. If you ever receive a packet from me in which the timestamp actually came from some time ago, you might actually want to reject this piece of information because it doesn't make sense that stuff I've sent took so long to get to you. Now, another way to work around this problem will be to use what is known as a nonce. A nonce is just a random number, and here's how we actually use it. Now, let's say A is communicating with B and wants to ensure that, you know, that's actually B and not someone pretending to be B. What you could do is you could actually create a random number and send it to B. What B is supposed to do is he's supposed to take this random number and encrypt it using his private key. Not the public key, but the private key. Then he'll actually send this encrypted nonce back to A, and A will actually use the public key of B to decrypt this information. If the nonce sent matches the decrypted nonce that you get back, then you can be sure that the other party is B. How can you be sure? Well, you see, simply put, only B knows his private key. No one else is able to encode information that can be decrypted using B's public key. This of course proves that the other party is actually B. This of course helps us in preventing a playback attack since we know for sure that right now at this present moment, we are indeed communicating with B and not someone else. And that basically is how public key cryptography works. By using both a public and a private key, you are able to ensure that communications are kept secret and at the same time, you can also confirm that the other party is who you think he is and not someone else pretending. These are just some of the fundamentals of cryptography techniques that are being used today. In particular, public key cryptography is the technique used today very widely. Of course, what I've covered with you today are just the basics. I did not go in depth into the actual math that makes this happen. Of course, we're also assuming that you are unable to figure out the private key by just looking at the public key. There are of course mathematical ways to actually make this a more difficult task. But yeah, the whole idea behind this entire discussion is to hopefully make you understand and be able to actually picture the whole concept of public key cryptography better. Anyway, that basically wraps it up for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget I appreciate every like, favorite, and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe. For more updates outside of YouTube, do follow my official Twitter account at 0612TV. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can also check out my About Me page. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV.